A tri-state digital buffer. A buffer is represented by this simple symbol. It's designed to take an input signal, an input voltage, and recreate that as the output voltage, input equals output. So it can be viewed as a unity gain amplifier. Its main purpose is to electrically isolate its two sides. So whatever generates a signal and whatever uses a signal cannot interact and mess each other up. Also, the buffer will have its own connection to power. So the buffer is going to be driving the output or syncing the output rather than the signal generator having to do it. So the buffer takes the work off. Digital, we're talking about data or logic. Ones and zeros, on and off, high and low. You've got a high and low voltage. Whatever they are, it doesn't matter, but a high and a low voltage. Input equals high, output equals high. Input equals low, output equals low. But I said tri-state. The input is still two-state. The input is high or low. But the output is the three-state. You could have high, low, or essentially off. High impedance. This is known as high Z. I forget YZ, it doesn't matter. And if you do a truth table, let's say you've got input, you've got enable, and you've got output. So input and output are just the input and output. Enable is a second signal, high or low, depending on how the chip works. It could be enable low, but let's say it's enable high. So you could have low, 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 high, high, low, or high, high. If enable in this one, since it's not got a bar over it, so it's regular enable. If enable is high, then the thing is on. So if the input is low, output is low. Input is high, output is high. If enable is low, that means the thing's turned off, high impedance. So we just say Z. In a truth table, you see it as Z. High impedance mimics an open circuit. No current or almost no current flows, also known as floating. And you might say, well, floating's bad because if you have a floating output connected to an input, that input can read electrical noise as a signal. That's true. But I didn't say that the thing reading this would be floating. I said this output would be floating. One extremely common way to hook this up is multiple buffers when you're creating something called a bus. Let's say you have three different signals, A, B, and C. Different devices, different pins, doesn't matter what it is. It's just three different signals. You have something like a microcontroller pin that you want to read these signals. Now, if it had to read these signals simultaneously, then obviously you would have to have three pins. Otherwise, the signals would get all jammed up. But in this case, only one of these is going to be communicating with D at a time. So there's no reason they couldn't share the input pin, because only one is going to be doing something at a time. But the trick is, let's say A is high and B is low. That means A and B are basically shorting power rails together, or the next best thing to it. And D is not going to know what's going on. Even though B might be just putting out nonsense, because it's not active, it's not... You're ignoring B, but you can't ignore B because it's electrically connected. So this is why buffers. We need to separate these three signals. So for three signals, we have three buffers. And of course, it'd be one chip and you have one pin per buffer. Connect them through the buffer. Each buffer has an enable pin and you can short these together into that, into the input. So what you can do is say A is active and B and C can hush. So you turn off these two buffers, turn on this buffer, and so you've only got one actual connection to D. B and C are blocked. The actual B and C don't know what's going on. If you were doing this without buffers, you would have to have some sort of protocol engineering in A, B, and C to allow them to turn themselves off. And you'd have to connect them up so that they could do that. And it, you have to worry about versioning and all this other stuff. But the buffer is part of the circuitry connected to D. It's ours. It's the device we're making. So you can plug anything into it. A, B, and C have no idea this is going on, and they don't need to know this is going on. A, B, and C will continue to output just fine, and the buffer will accept it, except the output will be closed off when we tell it to. So we just choke it off. So that's why this works. Now you might be saying, well, before we needed three pins to talk to three devices. Now we need one pin plus three pins is four pins to talk to the devices. Except remember that microcontrollers and especially their pins are the expensive thing. Just regular chips with a bunch of pins, but the chip is very simple. Oh, that's nothing. That's easy to mass produce. And so you get it for pennies. So let's say you had 16 input signals. So you'd have one pin to read from 16 different things. But in binary, you can represent 16 values with only four bits. So if you had just four additional microcontroller pins connected to a chip that converts from a binary number to 
one of 16 lines being on. You can connect that chip to these. The microcontroller then needs five pins to talk to 16 devices. And that chip that converts from binary to, you know, one line being on, dirt cheap. Or you could even do better. Let's say you could read these 16 devices round robin. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then around again, you know. So we could number them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 13, 14, 15, back to 0. So you could have some sort of chip that is an adder. It adds one to itself and then decodes that. Or even simpler, a 16-bit shift register or circular register, really. Again, it's going to be dirt cheap. And so you only need two pins, one pin to read, the other pin to keep signaling that thing. Increment, increment, increment. Every time the microcontroller wants to switch to the next device in line, just sends out a signal. So two pins can talk to not just 16, but any number. As big as you want that shift register to be, and you could hook multiple shift registers together, even. You know, one shifts into the other one and back around. And so with two pins, you could talk to any number of devices. That's the power of this. This is how you create a bus like this. And there's other things you can do with it as well. It should be obvious, but if you turn on more than one of these at a time, then that's invalid. Then we have the same problem as before, so only one of these is going to be on at a time. But what if none of them are on? Well, then you have your floating input, and that's bad. You could, of course, have a pull-up or a pull-down resistor. So if you had none of them on, then it would pull up or pull down, and then if one of them is on, it would override and be perfectly fine. But if you always know that one of them is going to be on at a time, then you don't need to pull up or pull down. And that's really all there is to it. It's just a buffer, a digital buffer that you can turn on and off. Now, how do you make one? Well, if you're making a real device, of course, you buy a chip. But I decided I wanted, for learning and fun, to make them out of BJTs. The internet was not terribly helpful because everybody on Stack Exchange wants to be the hero to solve the XY problem. The first thing they always say is, well, why do you want to do that? You shouldn't do that. Well, too bad. I'm doing it anyway. In the next video. Once it goes up, it'll have a similar name as this one. Tri-State Digital Buffer Made of BJTs. So feel free to join me then. For now, I'll be seeing you.